Special thanks from System Mastery to listener Mark Green for contributing the following reading material. We hope it brings you the pain you've brought us, Mark. Welcome to System Mastery, the podcast where each week we battle it out in System Mastery Stadium to discover which idiot's commentary reigns supreme in Terry. This week, Chairman Porcadillo has invited Iron Podcaster John to pit his skills in the arena of hate against Iron Podcaster American Jeff. But there is one more ingredient to today's competition. Our secret ingredient. The book on which these two jerks will display their literary acumen for the critical eye of our judges. Today's secret ingredient is... Numenon! And now, with a hardened heart and an empty soul, I say to you in the words of my uncle... Ale System Mastery! On. I asked him what his opinion was about Dungeons and Dragons, and he told me to get away, zit face. <laughs> uh. So, uh, welcome back to System Mastery, uh, the podcast where each week we get together and discuss an old RPG. Yeah. And uh, I'm Jeff, and as always, John is here with me. Hello, John. Hello. And this week we read a uh, very unusual book. It's uh, very unique. I will give it that. It is innovative. It is definitely one of the most interesting-ish books. Okay, so this book is called Numenon. And a Numenon is a thing. Is it? It's an actual, what is it? it? Why, a Numenon is, a, uh, is the concept of something that can exist that you can know exists without any kind of uh, actual evidence. So no physical evidence, no ability to smell, taste, hear, see, or touch it. But you know it exists, and that's that's what a noumenon is. Yeah, it's like Nicholas Cage's career. <laughs> but we have physical evidence of Nicholas Cage's career. He punched me on the set of Moonlighting. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't supposed to be there. <laughs> he called me a dirty hobo, <laughs> which I was. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, in in his defense. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's what a Numenon is, and right off the bat, I knew that before I, I went into the book, because I'm a weirdo. Yeah, I didn't know that. Uh, but as soon as I saw the title, I was like, oh god, because it's named after a, a very philosophical thing. Oh yeah, see, now, I had no idea what Numenon was when I got the book from you. So when I saw it, I was like, what is that, just like the name of some kingdom somewhere? I am the Prince of Numenon! Might as well be. It, it all, I... I think I originally almost got it confused for that Numenera book. Oh, yeah, that's that Monty Cook's Numenera, I think. Yeah, I and say. so I was like, wait a minute, we can't do that. That's actually in it's, stores. It's newish, and it just finished its Kickstarter, and apparently it's not terrible. That would have been a bad choice yeah, for us. Yeah, it's basically the exact opposite of this, in that <laughs> this is old and not in stores, and terrible. I wonder how... Did you check how old this was? I kind of forgot to. This might still be a new thing. Hey. There's, it's kind of timeless. It doesn't really have a whole lot of modern technology in it. It might still be in stores for sale. I I don't know. I kind of forgot to check. God knows. I I can't imagine this being in stores for sale. I have to imagine everything for this, this was is... Never, this was never in paper. Yeah, no. This is 100% PDF, maybe print to order. Yeah. So uh, you want to go over the basic concepts of what Numenon is and how you play it? <laughs> Would you like <laughs> me to try and summarize? <laughs> okay. So, uh, Numenon... You play as a bug. Uh, okay, a, uh, a regular-sized bug? No. Apparently, you're a human-sized bug, which I didn't know <laughs> until about 20 pages in. I gotta, I gotta admit, you told me that earlier, that you, that you're, when reading through it, you thought you played as a bug-sized bug in the, investigating a mansion, and to me, that's a great idea. Right? I yeah. thought it was gonna be straight up just like one of those, uh, weird children's stories, like the borrowers or some shit. Yeah, or like, like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Yeah. Because when it tells you, like, yeah, you are reborn as this insect, and you've got, like, chitin, and you've maybe you've got wings or mandibles or whatever, and you're going to be with a colony, and you explore a mansion. And I go, oh, okay, I'm a bug. So I'm playing Sim Ant. I'm up to speed on this. I'm like, sweet, there's going to be giant things. I'm going to try and, like, get in adventures yeah. when, like, i got to go through the kitchen, and there's, like, fire on the stove, and it's super threatening. But no. You have to you collect green pellets and take them back to the queen, but avoid the spider. <laughs> 
Yeah, so when I when I first read it, I thought, oh, that would make for a really neat adventure, being a bug-sized dude in a house. No, no, you are a man-sized bug and no one cares that you're a bug. Yeah, so basically you play as what's called a sarcophagi. <laughs> And I don't remember, is it sarcophagus for the individual? I, I think it's just always sarcophagi, right? Well, they only refer to you collectively because this game is all about the working as collective. a team. Yeah, yeah, it's all about the the, uh, the hive mind. The animal collective, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the, the flock of seagull bugs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the you... 10,000 maniacs, except they're insects. <laughs> and there's five of them. <laughs> the real big bugs. <laughs> yes. Fish. Bugs. <laughs> I think I might be done. That's good. Thank you. Green Day Insects. <laughs> uh, okay. The Brian Setzer Bugastra. <laughs> you didn't even get his name right. God damn it. <laughs> this is the worst. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. So, you, as a sarcophagus... Or one Let's of the sarcophagi. Sarcoph- Let's say that sarcophagi with an I is the plural, and sarcophagi with a U-Y is the singular. Yeah. And just move forward. Like, well, as, as a sarcophagi. As a sarcophagi. It's a certain kind of sarcophagi, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like something Christopher Walken would say. <laughs> uh, I was in New York, and I met a couple of uh, sarcophagis. Hey, I was in uh, Egypt. <laughs> Saw some sarcophagis. <laughs> They were big bugs. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. I'm okay, sorry. Okay. All right, okay. You, you okay, can tell us what the okay. book is now. <laughs> so, you were all once people. I mean... Probably. It doesn't... Assumably, you had... You were human. But you all have souls that have been stuck inside of these bug bodies. Uh-huh. And, and you're always born in groups. It's always at least three or four or sarcophagi are born at once. Yeah, and so, no matter what, there is always a colony, is what it is referred Mm to. Uh, And you have no memories of your past life, but you do have skills from it. Yes, you have knowledge and physical skills from your past life, and they make up two of your stats. Uh, one of them is basically the your, your ability to access your physical capabilities from from previous yeah, so lives. You've got activity is that stat. And then there's another one that is your ability to access the knowledge you gained in your previous life or lives. Which is wisdom. That's correct, yeah. And uh, I think there might be a third one. They call three of them the mystery stats, and two of them are those. I think the other one is... Personality. Personality. And is it, how easy you can talk to people, essentially. Any social thing you do is governed by personality. So you are born into a big chamber. Uh, it's the, you're you're in essentially what I assume is a cave. It's like a cave, and there's they have, bat monsters, and yeah, they have bat monsters. And the first thing that happens as soon as you are born is you are attacked by bat monsters, and you are always attacked by one less bat monster than there are people in the party, uh, so that you don't die. Yeah. But it, they you know they just they describe it as being the way of the Chiroptera, which are the bat monsters. Yeah, and they they're like yeah they send a few down to test what's going on down there, even like, though there's a bunch of them up there, like they, just a bunch. They just never send more down. Yeah, they are bad ninjas. Yeah, that's that's what happens. So uh, that's that's weird, but anyway, you are born in this little colony of bugs, and every bug is different. Yeah, uh, and so the, this is we should probably talk here a bit about the mechanics and what what the game. How, how to play the game before we dive into the... I mean, let's be nicer to people than the book is. Okay, yeah, because 100%, this book just gives you a bunch of weird, dumb crap at the beginning where it's like, well, you will be going on a journey through your mind into the world of the metaphysical and the metaphorical. Will you find out how to get through the Moulin Rouge? <laughs> I wish it was the Moulin Rouge. Right? That would make this book a million times better than what it is. <laughs> this book is set in a metaphorical mansion called the Silhouette Rouge. Yeah, but if it was said in the uh, the what, what do you want to call that the the Zelig period of France the 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 Moulin Rouge? No, if it was just straight up set in the movie <laughs> Moulin Rouge, and and you're like, Satine, I am a giant bug. Please be with me. That would be great. <laughs> okay, but first you have to sing Roxanne in a weird voice. Roxanne, <laughs> chitin, chitin. <laughs> tap your mandibles along. <laughs> That was pretty well done, by the way. Yeah, thank uh, you. Okay, so, so yeah, you, you play as bugs who explore a metaphor mansion called the Silhouette Rouge. You have nine statistics, and those statistics are awareness, 
which uh, I believe is pretty self-explanatory. Yep. Violence. Which is all of your combat. Every single time you're in combat, you roll violence. It's the only thing you roll. You roll it to hit, you roll it to dodge. So that's it's interesting that that's the mechanic. Dexterity is not the god stat here. Activity, which we already talked about, it's one of the mystery stats, they call them. They're, they're knowledge you have that you don't know why you have, because it's from past lives. So that covers... But activity act- is anything physical you do that isn't combat. Correct. Wisdom is anything mental you do that isn't combat, or can be combat, actually. There's mental and social combat in this. You try and hurt people with insults and stuff. Yeah. Uh, personality, same thing. Chitin, which is the strength of your bug skin. Yeah, it's how tough you are. Metamorphosis, which is your power during reality spasms, which is when the world goes all crazy and reality gets all fucked up in the in the ha- in the mansion. Metamorphosis is your ability to remain stable during those periods. Yeah. Oh my gosh, how Kafka esque. Ah, uh, yeah, so Kafka esque. Right? Am I right, everybody? Yeah. Everybody listening out there, if you agree that this is very Kafka esque, <laughs> or or even perhaps Nietzschean, please let us know. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, the book is letting us know. Yeah. All yeah. the time. So Kafka esque. <laughs> anyway, uh, so metamorphosis during big... It, it doesn't control your ability to change shape as a bug. It, it it controls your ability to resist shape change during reality spasms. Well, it's it's your ability to change reality when reality is changing. That's correct, yeah. Ugh. Communion, which is your uh, shared ability to communicate with the other members of your bug hive group, no, your, your commun- family. No, communion is the... Uh, with the lodestar. Oh, you can ask okay. questions of You're right. the Lodestar, which, which a, we will get into. Yeah, we'll talk about the Lodestar in a little bit. Just know that he is an important character, Yeah, and he speaks in enigmas. Cause of course he does. Fucking, oh, goddamn. Rapport, I'm sorry. Rapport is your de- your ability to connect with your own hive. Because you can speak telepathically with the other bugs in your colony. Yes, it also controls your ability to help heal the rest of your colony, is through Rapport. And that's because, and this is an interesting thing, this game's health system is called Salubrity... And it's universal. It's shared. Uh, if someone in your colony gets hurt, you are hurt the same amount because it's a shared pool of damage between all the bugs. Yeah, so if one person gets hurt, then the colony is hurt. And if one of them dies, the game is over. Yep. So you, you have to, it's really teamworky. You really have to help keep the other bugs alive. Yep. Uh, and so I had mentioned that, uh, chitin was your toughness. It is just your damage resistance. Yes. Because one of the things they mention is the sarcophagi do not tire. Mm -hmm. They don't sleep. They don't need food or anything like that. You are endlessly wandering through this mansion. Yeah, that's correct. So, uh, in case you wanted to have an adventure where someone had to keep watch or some shit like that, it's not this. Nope, this isn't that kind of a game. I don't know what kind of a game this is. It's a weird one. It's a game, that's for sure. So uh, each one of those has stats that range between 1 and, I want to say, 5 is your maximum for each one of those. Like 1 to 5, 1 to 6, something Some, like something that. Something in there. And every one of them starts at 1, and you get 9 additional points to spend however you want. It does point out that 1 is feeble and bad at things, and 2 is not great. Which means that most characters aren't going to start out with amazing stats in this game. You start oh, no. with... at best, you have a two in everything. Yes, so that's that's a that's an interesting choice. But uh, you know, it's it you're supposed to start as kind of a blank slate, uh, thin shelled. You are a bug. tabula rasa. A tabula rasa. How? Let, let me say it again. How Kafka esque. <laughs> oh, oh, god damn you, game. Oh boy. So, so in addition to getting your traits and everything, you also have birthrights. Birthrights are your bug things. They are the powers that are of a bug that you have. Yeah, so you might be able to have wings so you can fly. Or maybe you've got uh, a stinger so you can stab people. Most of these do very simple things in the game system. Like, for example, stinger and, I want to say, uh, mandibles. Man- mandibles. Both just add one point of damage to violence rolls that you deal. Yep. And uh, if you have them both, then you add two points of damage and that's it. Yeah. If you have, uh, for example, a slayerites, which is additional armor plating, then you re- reduce damage done to your sarcophagi form, your your body, by one. Yep. So, to a minimum of one. Yeah, so you always have one birthright at least, and then you can spend points on more. But... Yeah, your, your bug can just grow more bug parts. And you've got a bunch of weird things. So you can have things like, I've got the ability to like climb on walls and ceilings there's and only, things. There's only nine of them. Let's roll through. We've already done some of them. Pulvali are, I believe, your... You're walking on sunshine. <laughs> Yes, they're walking on sunshine. <laughs> okay, and then uh, I believe the spinneret is your ability to walk like an Egyptian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then Sensila is your ability to have a new way to walk. Walk, walk. 
Yeah, and then you've got Spined Chitin, which is, of course, uh, to walk on the This ocean. way. It's to walk this way. <laughs> <laughs> like she told me to. Yeah. No, okay. I don't even remember what Polville Eye is. Do you? Uh, that is your stick to the walls and ceilings. Okay. Wings self-explanatory. They let you fly around. Wings straight up better than Polville Eye, uh, if you read through what they can do. Oh, yeah, because it's harder to hit you if you're flying around. Yes, and Polville Eye just lets you walk on ceilings, which you can do with wings anyway. Yeah. So... You know, choose the right one there. If you're it's playing. not like you get tired because you're a sarcophagi, so it's not like, oh, beating my wings makes me sleepy. It's just, nope. I guess they maybe ran out of cool bug powers, so they were like, well, uh, oh, Spider-Man. Sti- yeah, sticky. Like, I, I, w- I would have liked to have seen them give uh, Bomber Beetle ability here. The Bomber Deer Beetle where you can sp- you can spray hot poop. <laughs> that would have made well, the game I mean, great. Come on, anyone can do that. <laughs> true. I do that on the daily. I'd like to roll to spray hot poop at my enemies. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay. Then wings, self-explanatory, lets you fly around. Stinger adds a point of damage. Spinneret lets you trap people in webs. Yeah, you can shoot some webs at things, and you can either use well, like. Wait, how do I shot web though? Uh, from your spinneret. Oh, okay, great. All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So you can use that to ensnare people and either pull them towards you or like climb up things, whatever. Creatures that are that are ensnared are very easy to hit. The difficulty to hit them is automatically a one. So that's a pretty powerful uh, effect to get. Slayerites is extra armor. Proboscis is the ability to, uh, I believe it's deal damage with punches. Or you, when you hit someone successfully, you can do... You can, instead of dealing... Normally you would deal damage equal to the successes, successes on your violence. This lets you do one point of damage, yeah. but you gain health back from it. One point of salubrity is returned to you because you sucked some blood. Sensilla has enhanced senses. Yep, you've got like antennae or... Uh, segmented eyes or whatever it happens to be, and you can see better and you get better awareness. Yes. Mandibles, another one point of damage ad- addition. And then Spined Chitin, which is whenever someone successfully punches you, they take damage. Yeah, if they if they grab you. Yeah, if they grab you. And then there's Spray Hot Poop, which, again... Self-explanatory. Yeah, I think so. That's pretty We've good. We've all been there. Yeah, what other bug powers? Everyone else... I mean, everyone has eaten at Taco Bell. I think we all understand <laughs> we all know, that. We, know, we all know how spraying hot poop works. <laughs> What are some other bug powers you think this game missed out on? Can you think of any? Oh, well, I mean, you've got to have things like you can light up your butt. Oh, yeah, glowing. Yeah, that's a really good one. No, just your butt. Just your butt. Bioluminescent butt. Yeah. Okay, that's a good one. I'd like, I'd like to walk fitfully around on water. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, okay. So, yeah, I've got a couple of those that they missed. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. So, uh, those are your basic stats, and then every character also chooses a principle. Yeah, the world works off of three principles. We have the principle of heart. So, uh, it talks about the interconnectedness of emotions and things like that. Yeah, it's the one that lets you communicate with, like, jungle baboons. And... Yeah, you get a little monkey, yeah. and you hang out with four people with way better powers than you. And they're all, also way older than you. Really, it just seems like it sucks to be you. Actually, and you know what? Of the various principles, Heart is kind of the worst. Oh, it really is. So, so you, you... again, Ma- Mati always has the worst powers. Yeah, so yeah. each of the three different uh, principles you can get have... Then three levels. Mm-hmm. So you can do Oracle, which is the uh, lowest level, then Adept and Master. So Heart lets you go like, oh, you can tell what other people feel at an Oracle level. Uh, at Adept, you can kind of influence how people feel. And then at Master, you can reverse them. And that's all it gives you. Yeah. It's like, oh, are you nice? You're mean now. Nah. Yeah. Or do you like war? No, you hate war. Yeah, it lets you... I think, is it... Heart or mind that lets you cut someone off from the logos. That's mind. Yeah, that's the last. Mind is better. The last step of mind is to cut someone off from logos, which is the god of this game. Yeah, the the logos, the logos. It's yeah. the Nike swoosh. The the record of logos war. That's the game. But the logos is uh basically god, and you never get to see it. It's very metaphory and very Kafka esque. <laughs> But it's a god that no one can access, but everyone knows is there. And it, it, you're trying to solve prop puzzles that it laid out for you is the basic premise of the game. Well, the, the whole thing is you get, like, sent into the Silhouette Rouge because the Logos wants to experience what it is like to be alive. And so it is taking your bug thing. Bug experiences. And, yeah. Which uh, seems like a weird choice. Why do it with bugs? Why do it with weird, never-tiring bugs? Part of the experience of being alive is going to sleep. Yeah. Or eating. These are all parts of the, the the life experience that for some reason he decided to strip out of his investigatory tools. Yep. Whatever. 
Great. So those are uh, the other two are time, which lets you mess with time, which is the most powerful thing you can do. Significantly most powerful. Like the the Oracle level lets you do simple little time tricks, but the the uh, Add Up level lets you uh, like take two actions in a turn. Oh, oh, by the way, the mechanic by which all of these these uh, principles, which are basically the spell casting of this game, uh, or the skill set of this game. The way that all of these work is just via difficulty checks. There's no uh, uses per day. There's no there's no magic powers. It's just difficulty checks to accomplish things you'd like to accomplish with these. And every character starts with one of the three principles at the first oracle level. Yep. So you start out as a wimp, wimp in one of them, and you can purchase additional ones or buy up your way through them using this game's XP system, which is called Enlightenment. Yay! Oh, Christ. Oh, God damn. As you gain enlightenment, you will become more in tune with the powers of the universe. And then you'll spend it to buy wings. <laughs> All you need is these quartz crystals and... You can put them near you, and then it'll take all of your <laughs> Reiki energy, and it'll... But be careful, because chemtrails can steal your orgone. Oh, you'll have to be able to use this water that once held some sh- deadly nightshade in it to... I don't know, whatever, get dumb you, bullshit. Get your head in a pyramid. <laughs> Come on, get your head in the pyramid game. I, I can do this all day. That new agey shit's my favorite. Uh, First of all, you got to make some organite crystals, which are basically little flecks of crap embedded in an epoxy resin into a barbell-shaped flat thing. Then you want to heave that over a fence at a cell phone tower to destroy the negative energy emanating from it. You can also load those into a cannon that you use to shoot chemtrails from the sky! Because you live in the middle of the United States and are crazy. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so there you go. Anyway, uh, you pick one of those and you get it as a spellcasting sort of ability. Okay. Now, the only other ability that your character has in this game that's relevant is that during... Reality spasms. Uh, bug people or sarcophagi can uh, attempt to grab hold of the chaotic powers that are flowing through the earth, which or through the silhouette rouge, which appear as various tendrily things, and use them to do stuff. You can use them to swat swat at people. Uh, to cr- uh, so yeah, to you trap them. You get uh, your metamorphosis stat is used for literally everything during a reality spasm. So normally you're like. Oh, if I want to check and see if I see something, I use awareness. I got to talk to a guy. I'm using personality. As soon as reality flips, turns upside down, then you have to take a minute. Just sit right there. And then I'll tell you how I became the prince of a town called Bel Air. Oh, boy. It always takes me too long to realize you're doing that. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> as soon as a reality spasm starts... That's just by DJ Jazzy Sarcophagus, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> The sarcophagus. The sarcophagus. That would be a great ska band, actually. Yeah? Yeah, like Egyptian theme? Yeah, I would totally see that. I would. I would see them open for the Aquabats. <laughs> or the Hippos. Yeah, sure. Yeah, why I, not? I was alive in 1997, and I got two ears and a heart. I know a lot of ska bands. <laughs> so, yeah, when uh, reality goes crazy, you can do things. So the easiest thing to do is see the tendrils of reality, and you need to do that before you can manipulate it. And that is using esoteric vision, which and is the first level of reality spasm management. It's it, only a difficulty of one. So all you need is one success, and you can see things. Great. Right. Okay. Then you can start doing stuff, like uh, firing it off as lightning. Yeah, so at, at that point, you essentially do the exact same three powers, just at different scales. There's only one, yeah. There's So it's like, you can shoot lightning, or you can shoot at, a like, the next level of difficulty. It is five for that, which is chain lightning, so hit a bunch of people. Or you zap everyone. Literally, literally everyone. Literally everyone in the Prima Materia can be attacked with lightning. Uh, you can't see it, but I am making the worst face. What, what, you don't like the term Prima Materia? Uh... Would you say that's better or worse than Silhouette Rouge? I would say it is worse than Silhouette Rouge, because at least every time I read that, I think Moulin Rouge in my head, and that's slightly better. Could it be because Prime Material is totally a thing that people say already, and you don't need to change it to Prima Materia for no reason? Yep. Prima Materia just sounds like a real version of one of those strategy guides you buy at GameStop. Oh, I got a real one. It's Materia. I got a <laughs> Prima Materia. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you can use it uh, to shoot lightning, you can use it to make tentacles... Which is essentially like having spinnerets, but you can use it on whatever. Yeah, you can use it to be completely undetectable. Yep, and then, uh, the, like I said, the other levels of that is then you can shoot lightning at everyone in a room, or use, like, grab everyone in a room. Or make everyone in a room invisible, and it goes on. Yeah, and then at the very end, it's just, you blow up the world, whatever, who gives a shit. Yeah, level nine of this is Chaos Unbound, which is you can do whatever the fuck you want within reason is set by the DM. 
Yeah, it's Which just... you decide whatever you want to do, and then you do it. That happens a lot. Like, for example, if you want to use communion to see the future, you can do that in this game. And you're allowed to answer fund- or ask fundamental questions of the universe by making significantly high difficulty checks. Like, but then the GM just has to answer you with, like, uh, the, the rose has many petals, and they fall upon a lake. But is the lake still, or are you in movement with the waves? Yeah. It says... If players ask fundamental questions of the universe, which they only do if they make significantly difficult difficulty checks, then you get to, they get to ask you fundamental questions about the Silhouette Rouge in the world. But you probably don't know the answers to that, because we didn't put them in this book, so you're going to have to make up some esoteric stuff to keep them on their toes. Maybe the uh, Lodestar speaks in fancy code. <laughs> okay, <laughs> oh, so let's talk about the Lodestar. Speaking of the Lodestar, once you are done fighting your bat monsters in your cave of birth, the Lodestar uses the, the Schwartz... To battle Darth or Dark Helmet. Yeah, that's that's exactly what happens. Yeah. And scene. <laughs> <laughs> so Lodestar is a guy with an elephant head mm-hmm. who then shows up after you finish your battle and is like, Let me show you the way into the silhouette rouge. And of course he's dressed like he's in Mulan Rouge. He's got he's, like a full... He looks like Babar. Yeah, he looks like Babar or a little bit like the white rabbit, only with an elephant head. Yeah. Like, he's got a waistcoat and a pocket watch fob. He's yeah. one of those. Oh, yeah. No, honestly, the weird thing is, as soon as it was, there's a guy and he has an elephant head and he will lead you to wherever, I immediately pictured him as being in that, like, that, outfit. that dumb, like, Checking his suit. watch. Yeah, I'm a Victorian gentleman type thing. Because, of course, it would be a Victorian gentleman guy who's leading you. Yeah. It would be uh, better if it was just Ganesh. I'd be way happier if it was right? just, just Ganesh shows up and he's like, What's up? I'm Ganesh. Let's do this, yo. <laughs> yeah, I got some chocolate Ganesh for you. Oh. Ah. Uh. So he shows you into the Silhouette Rouge. You go through the gate of some bullshit. And then he disappears. And he's like, Hey, man. Uh, welcome to the Silhouette Rouge. You're supposed to find out, like, the nine trials. The nine enigmas! You will, uh, go through some stuff and maybe reach enlightenment. Bye! And then he leaves, and you are left in the foyer. Alright, so, we gotta do one more thing before we break down the, uh, the, the house. And that's, we wanna tell people how they play this game. No. No, you, fuck that. You, you I'm leaving it in the order of the book? Yeah. Okay, I'm so leave it till the very end. Alright, let's, let's tell them that, at least that then. In this book, you don't learn how to play this game until page 75. And, and the book is 113 pages long. Oh yeah, so it's like, hey, welcome to this thing. Here's the stats. Here's the different things you've got. All right, here's the dumb rooms. You're like, wait a minute, how do I play this game? Oh, we'll get to that don't, eventually. Don't even worry about it. We'll get there. So we're not going to tell you just yet what the difficulty chart is and how you a- a- do it, but uh, stay tuned. All right, so inside the house, there is an upper floor and a lower floor. The lower floor has a foyer. The upper floor merely has three hallways. The lower floor also has three hallways, each of which leads to seven rooms. Inside of every one of these rooms is Psych 101. <laughs> yes. Every room contains some psych chapter, yep. and you have to read it and then give a book report. That is essentially how this works. So you open up a door, and let's say, for example, that inside of that room there are a whole bunch of people walking around towards a un- uh, from a uh, undetermined point to a different undetermined point, and it's in it's dark in there, and they all have robes on their heads, and they're all carrying candles, and they will fight you if you mess with their candle. But if you find one that doesn't have a candle that's lit, and you light his candle, then perhaps he shall answer three questions. But the questions he answers shall be, or the answers he delivers, shall be veiled in mystery and esoteric wisdom. Yep. That's and, one of the rooms. And that is probably the most straightforward of the rooms. Oh yeah, that's good. Not, not surprising seeing as how 10 of the 21 rooms are, you open the door and a story in first person is happening in there. Oh yeah, so. <laughs> a short story. Like imagine if any other game did this bullshit. Imagine if like, you're like, okay, tell me about Waterdeep, Forgotten Realms campaign guy. What's Waterdeep like? I stood atop a crumbling tower. Or at least what was known as a tower. My wife had left me the day before, and I remembered that she had left me, and it hurt. Yeah, so... Oh, okay, next on. So the the <laughs> book has 21 rooms on the bottom floor, and probably a good half are just short stories of the lost one and his experience there, in that room. There are four specific rooms that reference the lost one and what he does. The Lost One is the only person known in history who has ever solved the Nine Enigmas. Probably. We aren't sure. Possibly. He may also still be in the Silhouette Rouge. He may be in the Nowhere. 
he may be in the heart, maybe in the kidneys, yeah. maybe even in the colon. Do you think he we might don't be? Know. Do you think he might be somewhere in the prima materia? No. Oh, okay. No, right. he is not. All right. Well, there you go. The lost one is described as someone who came to the Silhouette Rouge looking for his parents. And maybe. Maybe. All of this is maybes. Everything in this game starts with a maybe. Yeah, it's like, oh, and then the lost one showed up here, and there's clippings in this room of a child trying to find his parents, and it looks like the lost one, and could this be him? Uh, here's my question about the lost one. Is he a bug? I don't know. I think so, maybe? Because, other, because okay, did a human make his way into this metaphoric super heaven and try and solve his way out? Is that what happened, or was he a bug? And if he's a bug, how come he doesn't have the whole family structure that you do? We have to be fucking bugalos. We, I mean, every one of us has to walk through the whole place going, family. And, and, you know, if one of us gets hurt, we all do. But this guy, oh no, he just wanders around looking for his parents, and then he solves the nine puzzles and he gets to flit off. Yeah, and see, we, what this is, is he's actually ICP. Yeah. And we're all the followers. Oh, okay, I get it. So he's, he's Violent J and Shaggy 2 Dope, and merged into a single entity who needs to find yeah. his parents. Shaggy too violent. Shaggy too violent, who has to find his parents, and then we, as his loyal juggalo buggalo followers, have to follow them and uh swim through a river of Fago. Yeah, see we we are in the silhouette circus. Yeah, that's right. And uh we need to use our hatchets to get through the Let's see, if you open up door three, it's the fresh ass comedy tent in there, I'm pretty sure. Where Bobcat Goldthwaite will be coming on before someone whose name is just Eugene. Yeah, there's a room where Tila Tequila is constantly being assaulted. <laughs> That'd be way better than what there actually is, which is where you like open up a door and there's a room where the nothingness howls your guilt at you. There's, okay, so there is a room that is, I mean, we we keep talking about like the Psych 101 thing. There is a room that is literally that. Yeah, no, literally. And I know the is, one here. It is called the Revenge Room. Yeah. In the revenge room, you are shown a person that you knew in your past life uh, that did you wrong. And it shows you the wrong that they did to you in the worst light possible for them. So it doesn't show them the like, oh, they thought they were doing the right thing. Whatever they did, it was like out of spite or they're just being an asshole or whatever it is. So you see all that and then there's a button in front of you. And that button will punish them. You don't get to see what it does. You don't know what the punishment is. But you know, if you press this button, it will punish that person. Do you press the button? <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't keep going with that. Like, I wanted to find a room where you go in there, and as soon as you're in, you are assigned to be a prisoner or a security guard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or or a room where you go in, and you are forced to salivate when you hear a bell ring. Why not just go through all the original psych experiments? It'd be great. Uh, we have other ones that are at least as straightforward as that for the whole psych thing, where there's one where it's like, you see rows upon rows of endless people all smashing things, and oh, then yeah. if you get caught by the, the people, stilt men, the stilt men, which you can fight them and you can kill them, but there are an infinite number and you will eventually lose. Yes, you have to lose to the stilt men, and then they haul you in front of a table which has a bunch of possessions on it, which you eventually come to realize are possessions belonging to your past life. Yeah, they are your things, and even if you don't remember them, you still on a visceral level, have a connection to all of them. Yeah. And then they want you to smash them. So, here's my problem with this. Okay, first of all, you're a party of bugs. You have to be. You have to be a party of bugs in this game. Yes. So, you get grabbed by the stilt men and dragged to a collection of your possessions, and then you have to smash them. You can't fight your way through the stilt men, because the stilt men are endless in number, and they actually have a difficulty nine grab that they put on you, if you read their stats at the back of the book. Yeah. Uh, so, they are going to catch you, and they are going to haul you over to a prison where you have to smash your old stuff. It's going to happen. You have There's nothing you can really do about it other than never going in that room. Yep. So the thing is, you can escape from the room after they've captured you. Oh, yeah. They don't really care once they've dragged you to the table. Yeah. The stilt men care about getting people to the tables that are new, but don't really care about the people already at tables, though they will still try and get you back, just not as v vigorously. Yeah, something. Something so to be. Then it it tells you, like, if you smash your items, then you begin to feel freer because you have gotten rid of your earthly attachments or whatever bullshit. Uh, but you can also just decide this is dumb and leave. Yeah, a lot of the book feels like, we were talking about this earlier, a lot of this book feels like it was written using psych dice, which are our version of sex dice, except that they are psych dice. Oh yeah, so, you know, normally you'd have sex dice and it's like, lick, elbow, and you'd roll these dice and it'd be like, Concentrate on 
Jungian self. And you're like, okay. <laughs> all right, I got it. So this is a room where you concentrate on your Jungian self. It's like, all right, destroy earthly possessions. Oh, all right, all I right, get so, that. So there's a room where invincible stilt monsters force you to destroy your earthly possessions. Okay, sure. Uh, let's see. D- uh, carefully examine feet. Oh shoot! I'm sorry. One of my one of my sex dice managed to get in there. <laughs> oh damn it! I, I uh okay. Well, there's a sex dice room where you have to examine your oh, feet. I, I got Quentin Tarantino's sex dice. Oh, one of them just says feet. It's, it's got a whole die. It's just feet. And on the other side, the other one it just says make movies about. <laughs> <laughs> Every single time he rolls it, it's just make movies about feet. <laughs> it's worked eight movies so far. <laughs> yeah, let's see what my sex dice say to do, shall we? Yeah. I don't know what Quentin Tarantino actually sounds like. Yeah, he sounds like an old gangster, apparently. <laughs> yeah, let's see what my sex dice have to say. <laughs> yeah, <see>? yeah. <laughs> well, it's not that dip. My, my, uh, my, what's his name from like Twin Peaks and stuff? I always think he sounds like a 1920s baseball announcer. <laughs> <laughs> Help um, me out. What's that guy's name? Uh, uh, uh. I ruined it by not giving you yeah, his name, didn't I? You, you did. You've destroyed me. Oh, I'm you, so sorry. You ruined me, Jerry. <laughs> anyway, yeah, Quentin Tarantino rolls his dice to make a movie. Let's see. Let's see. What should I do for a sex tonight? Uh, make a movie about feet. What do you, <laughs> these dice are great. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, every room is just, at best, what we've mentioned. The rooms we've mentioned so far are the ones where you actually have a goal, possibly. Sort of. Some of the other ones are, okay, there's one that's called Scorpio. Scorpio is a room where there is a dance club called Scorpio. The people there are at varying degrees of their face missing. Mm -hmm. Some people are completely featureless on their face. Some people, like, just have eyes or a nose. Other people have their whole face there. And so you go in and you get caught up in the dance if you begin to dance and you really want to dance like there's ass in your pants. Yeah, you just want to dance. You just want to dance all night. And, and you don't want to mess with any boys. You're just here to dance. Yeah, you just, you just want to dance, dance, dance. Yeah. And no one's going to put you in a corner. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me just real quick point out that all the other dancers in the room are humans. And everyone else in the world that you encounter is either some kind of weird monster or a human. You are the only sarcophagi that you'll ever find wandering around. There's yep. only one family of them in there at a time. <laughs> there are no other bugs. Yeah. There's just your little group of bugs. So everyone else is human, and that doesn't really bother you as a bug. You're used to and that. And it doesn't bother them that, that you're a giant bug. No, none of them even seem to notice that. Uh, How s- Kafka-esque. <laughs> Indeed. I'm going to keep saying that. It's the only time it's ever appropriate. So, like, in Scorpio, they're the edges of the uh, hall that you are in are just nothingness. And occasionally people will get bumped out into the void. Mm-hmm. And then eventually they'll come back through the door and then they'll have their face back because it's normally the faceless people that get bumped off. Yeah, so you dance until you lose yourself and then you then you lose yourself yeah. into nothingness. And then and you lose yourself in the moment, the music. Yeah, you own you, it. You've got mom's spaghetti on your sweater already. Mom's spaghetti on your spaghetti already. Mom's, mom's spaghetti. spaghetti. <laughs> Knees weak, arm spaghetti. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> You, uh, at, and then there are bouncers in there, which are dudes with horns. Yeah, this, the bull men or the, of Scorpio. And you, those guys you can fight. They have stats. And if they kill a guy, then everyone just leaves. Yeah. Like, all the dancers stop dancing and go, huh, and then just walk away. And if you leave the room and come back later, everyone's dancing and the bodies go. They'll, they'll reset it. Yeah. And it, it means nothing. It's just, you're dancing. And then, and then you, you're not dancing. You leave the room. Who knows? Whatever. Who gives a shit? So we don't know if this is... Here's the thing about this. It feels like you're reading about, like, uh, concentrated afterlifes. Like, the people who are dancing around in this room are doomed to dance around in this room. It's like what they do after they die. Yeah. But it doesn't... It's not set that way. It just feels like that. It has this weird setup where it's almost like the whole, like, punishment fits the crime, Dante's Inferno type thing. Yeah, exactly. Except there's no, there's nothing there. And also... Dancing ain't a crime. This ain't Footloose. <laughs> this is my town. I'm John Lithgow. <laughs> Damn you, Kevin Bacon. And I hate dancing. <laughs> I've never seen Footloose, so I'm just going to assume I, I, that you could retitle it as The Man Who Hated Dancing and make it about John Lithgow. Oh, 100%. Could you you could just that? do an entire movie about John Lithgow. 
Oh, okay. Well, I'd prefer to do that anyway. Yeah. I like him better than Kevin Bacon. And and so I'm going to make my own version of that movie called The Man Who Hated Dancing and Was Right. Yeah, and then a guy shows up in town and tries to tear down society. Yeah. And we have to fight against his horrible and, influence. And society was great. It was a perfect society. There wasn't any dancing. You could buy tacos. <laughs> You could get your back scratched for a nickel down at the corner store. <laughs> the corner store, corner store back scratchery. Yeah, but now there's just dancing everywhere, dancing in the streets. And who do we turn to but the man who hated dancing, John Lithgow? Save in us, theater. John Lithgow. <laughs> Coming soon to theaters everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then there's all of the ones that are just a short story. There are a ton of those, and there's half of them are in first person. Another, I'd say a quarter of them are in second person. And then the last ones are stories about people. Yeah. There's almost the entire upper story. It's just yeah. stories about a guy. Yeah. So it's like, this dude showed up and he thought he was a super badass warlord. And then he was like, show me your moves. And I, then a guy was like, fight this army. And that was it. You're yeah. Like, okay, why did you tell me this? And I want to say that guy's name, and I'm going to try to here. Kai Tang Nim Jin Yao. You think I got it right? I don't know. It's it's five Chinese words in a row with some dashes in there, sprinkled as in, in as if by accident. Yep. And uh, and he's a character that matters. And he wanders around with a sword. He doesn't actually have very good stats. You could kill him with a punch. But he's up there, and he's doing stuff. Which a is lot- weird, because it talks about him as like, he's conquered realities, and he goes around, and he's an ultra badass. And well, you're like, really? Well, maybe, you know, it would make sense to me if this if heaven is all charged up, like... If, really? If because this... I thought heaven was a place on earth. I thought heaven was a half pipe. Ah, <laughs> uh, the world may never know. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> that's the true point of the silhouette ruse is to determine whether heaven is a place on earth or a half pipe. It could be both. Sandy, or who, who wrote uh, the original heaven is a place on earth? Who was it? Uh, so, I don't know, the bugaloos? The bugaloos. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, perfect. And then, uh, heaven is a half pipe by OPM. I have no idea where that came from or why I even know that. Yeah. They had two songs. Yeah, the uh, El Capitan. Yeah, there you Ooh, go. Yeah. Uh, nice. You... Both of us know two OPM songs. <laughs> <laughs> look them up and then immediately forget about them like everyone else did. Come on, look up, look them up like James. <laughs> James. We love dumb music here. Also, look up the Aquabats. Check out Fashion Zombies. It's a great song. You'll love it. Come on, guys. You probably know the Aquabats. Everyone knows the Aquabats. They have a TV. They have like two TV shows. Yeah. They're yeah. great. They're so awesome. Good. Go see them in concert. It's so cool. Anyway, moving right along. There's, oh, okay, lower floors, 21 weird rooms. Weird shit happens in them. There's some puzzles. Maybe they relate to the lost one. You don't know. Okay, upper floor. There's a succession of rooms you have to go through. Each one of them's got keys and locks, and there's people up there that tell you about the keys and locks. It, it reads like a, like one of those text puzzle like Zork games. Yeah, from, you're like, get key to room. Did you mean key to room or key to room? Did you want me to take the key into the room? Like, you want me to get the key into that room, or do you want me to get the key... That opens that room. I'm sorry, you cannot get ye key. Cannot parse command. Oh, but I want to get ye key. <laughs> anyway, there's a bunch of keys and a bunch of doors, and they open to doors that have keys, and it's just it's just shenanigans up there. Oh, and that's also where all of the named NPCs are. And well, it's also where there's actual danger because the servants of the adversary are there. Yes, the servants of the adversary, the the creature that eats sins, the. Uh, the, the giant congregational machine. There's a giant cloud that is itself a dream. Yeah. And it doesn't attack you, but if you get caught into it, you may be lost in a dream forever. And it's got a dumb name that's impl- completely impossible to remember. It's like yeah, the Kazentary or something. No, it, it is essentially like Mr. Mixie's Spitalik for yeah. what the, it's all just no vowels. Yeah. And then there's, uh, there's a giant grindy machine made of rotating, contra-rotating discs that's followed around by a procession of chanting cultists who occasionally hurl themselves into it and are ground up by it. Yeah. There's a... There's a big slug that eats anything that is trash. Yeah. It, so it won't... You pass right through it if you're alive. It won't even touch you. But it just slugs its way around, like, eating dead bodies and trash and shit like that. So it basically resets the stage after you come around through it. There's a man whose head is the sun. Yeah, there's Sol Invictus. Sol Invictus. And Sol Invictus is a nice guy who wants to help the bugs. Of course, because he's Sol Invictus. There's, uh, gosh, there's so many of these. There's the Minotaur. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, the Amrathian or some shenanigans who is a guy in, like, coveralls who's like... 
hey, I'm just here to help, like, fix the pipes. Yeah. Like, you have a weird name for what is essentially a plumber. Yeah, because he's probably another secret thing. And they're all upstairs just trying to work off each other and talking to each other. And there's libraries up there and weird rooms. that it's There's the Mayhawk who's all about boning. <laughs> yep. We can't even... There, there's something like 50 rooms and they're everything in the... It, 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 it's so weird that this place feels expansive and big, but it's all just these rooms. Yeah, and every room is just a thing. And it's just a puzzle. It's rarely like you open a room and there are 30 orcs in there and they, they are guarding a treasure that you need. No, it's, there's, like, you open a room and there's a yogi sitting in the lotus position. He has actual lotuses floating around him and a book floating in front of him and the book is reading him stories. Yeah. Like, okay, but what else? No, that's the room. That's the room. That's you, it. You guys figure it out. And that doesn't tell you what he can, you know, it's like, well, you can ask him questions, I guess. Well, you can, like, listen to the story, and then you experience the story. Yeah. But it doesn't matter, because then the story ends. Yeah, it's it's so weird, because none of this really leads to anything. It's it's all supposed to be, like, when you read the how to how to run this game section in the back, it's, it's very deep into the, like, well, we filled the whole place with metaphors and symbolism and shit, so that you can figure things out. You should add a bunch more symbolisms and metaphors and... And like here's the list of similes. And, here's the list of things that we put in there: bugs, uh, yeah. spiders, bones, can- books, candles, and then it's like maybe you put your own metaphors in there. Whales, whatever, put them in there. Yeah, and the problem is you go through all these rooms, and when you're first reading through it, you'd think, okay, well, this is just like what players might read, so they'd know what's going on in a room. But you, as the GM, should know. What is actually happening? No, of course you don't. No, it's all it's all open to examination and interpretation. That's the whole point of this game is that you're supposed to, you know, it's it's supposed to be procedurally generated based on these chunks that they gave you. Yeah. Okay. So once you get through all of this dumb crap, it actually tells you how to play the game. Oh yeah. Finally, we got like 15 minutes left in this podcast. Let's do this. How do you play the game? What's the magic system? How do you roll against difficulty, John? You use Domino's. Yay! You it's call the... Domino's Pizza, yeah. and then you eat that and stop playing this dumb game. You call Domino's Pizza and ask them if they think that a talking giant bug should be able to scale a nearby wall. <laughs> hello, hello, Domino's Pizza? Yeah, I was wondering, is the Jungian shadow more relatable to an oak tree or an apple tree? Thanks! <laughs> hey! Well, this is Domino's Pizza. We're glad you called and asked us weird esoteric <laughs> philosophy questions. If you'd like to order pizza as well, press 1. Press 2 to go fuck yourself. <laughs> press 3 to talk to the Lodestar. <laughs> <laughs> Which is something you're going to keep trying to do. So yeah, you use dominoes in this game. It says you need a standard set of double six dominoes. You do indeed. Now you work at a nerd store. Do they sell double six dominoes there? Of course they do. And do they, are there varieties of sets or is double six the actual standard? Uh, double six is normal dominoes. You then get double nine and then double twelve, which is your Mexican train. Okay, well, I'm glad to know you actually know about dominoes. Hey, what do you know? <laughs> All right, good. Okay, so you need a standard set of dominoes. Here's how this works. Remember how you have stats. You have, uh, like, for example, a uh, wisdom of two. That means you get to pull two dominoes. Now, the uh, DM is going to pull a single domino and set a difficulty. Yeah, so that that domino is your lead. That's the lead. And the way that this works is if you're playing as an individual bug and you don't have your party to help you, and your DM says, all right, you need to convince this guy to get out of your way. And he's not especially difficult to convince. His difficulty is one. So I pull, I reach into my bag of dominoes and I pull one out at random and I put it down on the table. And it's got a one on one side and a six on the other. Now your persuasion ability is two do, two dots or what? I don't remember which stat is which, but yeah, your personality is pers- two, two. So you grab two. two dominoes. Now, if you can connect even one of them to the one or the six on my domino, you started to create a train, and that train is currently at a length of one. So you have succeeded. Yep. Now. Uh, since, as we had mentioned in the beginning, probably the highest any of your stats is going to be is maybe three or four if you really want to specialize in something. Or if you've been playing for a long time. Well, yeah, but at the start, yes. you're going to be essentially garbage at almost everything, maybe one thing you'll be okay at. So, th- so the reason that this works is because you're not supposed to make a whole lot of rolls alone. No, you are supposed to be working with everyone else. So... Let's say you've got three bugs together, and they want to uh, try and climb a thing. So you're all going to help each other climb. You're using activity. You get whoever has the highest activity as your base. They become the trump. So the trump, say, has a three in activity, Mm because he decided he wanted to be all good at that. So you take him. He gets his three dominoes. Then anyone else who is helping gets one, Mm -hmm. regardless of what their stat is. Yes. So for every person helping you, you get another one. 
And then you, uh, then all go off of the lead. Now the trump doesn't have to start. So if you've got a 1-6 and the three you pull don't have a 1 or a 6 anywhere on them, as long as someone else has one, they can play it and you can play off of those. Right. And the highest difficulty possible in the game is a 9. Which seems crazy hard to do. Right. But you're supposed to have players who also have stats in the super high range by then. But it is, you know, it's intentionally super hard to do. Because because things you do at a level 9 difficulty are stuff like, ask God what the universe is all about. Yeah. Like, the level 9 stuff is straight up just insane bullshit. Destroy everyone in the world. It's all stuff like that. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, but it's up there. So so basically, average difficulty in this game is like a 2. And so everything you do, every single time you roll to deal damage, to uh, to not get hit by someone, you play a little game of dominoes. Yep. And that's it. And then as soon as you're done, you throw all the dominoes back in a bag. Yep. There you go. That's the mechanic. I like it. I think it's... Honestly, going through this, I I had to read 75 pages of stupid Psych 1, like, dumb, hippie okay. nonsense, it's and like, then you get to page 75 and they go, Hey, you know what the mechanic is? You pull a domino and see if it connects to these dominoes. You can have help from your friends. Simple. Easy. Easy. Super good. It's like, it's like they, someone came up with a really good system for how to play and make an interesting team game. A game where people have to play with each other and work together and they really wanted to focus on that because they shared health pool. Oh yeah. yeah, at its core, the system is great. Awesome. And then the, the, everything between page one where it tells you how to build your character and page 75 where it tells you how to play your character is like if you took a grad student, put them in Psych 101, and then threw all of that in a blender. Yeah, it's, just, it is, and it's, Definitely not an actual psych student. It's almost assuredly oh, it's a literary. Lit, yeah, yeah, it's a lit student who then took Psych 101 and is like, let me show you all of these things that I am writing the stories of the mind. I think I've accelerated to a level beyond the basic concept of role-playing game design. Yeah, uh, we don't do standard orcs and goblins in this. That's so reductive. You see, in our game, we mm. like to challenge the players to really exist on another level. And honestly, the description at the beginning sounds like one of those horseshit video game guys yeah. who describes their new indie oh, game where yeah. they're like, our game is really going to challenge players to interact with not just the environment, but their s- themselves in the environment. Yeah. Procedurally generated content. Othering the otherness. That <sighs> sort of thing. Just, yeah, no, it, it definitely sounds like someone's Kickstarter video for the worst indie game ever. It sounds like someone bought grad student refrigerator magnet poetry and just scattered it on a table and organized it into a book. Oh, yeah. They're like, the colonialism <laughs> of my preternatural darkest mind is flowing through a shadow realm? Yeah. The... Reductiveness of my feet. Oh man, again! <laughs> <laughs> Make movies about feet. Damn it! <laughs> How did my Tarantino movie magnet set get in here? <laughs> All right, let's well, let's try and roll these different dice. Uh, I got uh, smoke trees and every day. <laughs> uh, All right, amen. <laughs> so, so yeah. the basics are: the, this game is deeply playable. Uh, yeah, the yeah. system itself. Yeah. Love it. be used for whatever. Love it. It's a great system. I love it. I, the, the, the whole middle of the book is just empty headed nothing that you, I mean, you, they admit, they tell you in the DM section, look, look, I, I like to picture this guy with kind of a dumb New York accent, even though it's clear he was like some grad student, but look, we took a bunch of, uh, symbolism and whatnot and we, we stuffed it in there. There's lots of, you figure it out. You, so we, we took some, uh, some mango peach sorbet, we encrusted it with symbolism, then we took the secret ingredient of Numenon, and we worked that into the spice on the side. Yeah, yeah, it's right there, it's on your plate, eat it. <laughs> Come on. If you don't like it, you can put some extra seasoning on there, I don't know, maybe you like different symbolism or something. What, what are you, queer? Figure it out. <laughs> uh, that's, yeah. That's, that's how this looks, like, they, like, they basically admit that in the DM session, like, hey, we didn't put any answers in here, cause, you know, we didn't have any. Yeah, we because, got the end of this. because there are no answers. Yeah, so, so we get to the end and, well, I don't know, you figure it out. That's, that's how this reads. Yeah. That's, but on the other hand, the rules are great. Yeah, I would, I would take these rules and put them in almost any other setting. Yeah. And run that. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I, I mean, you'd have to make some minor changes to it. The whole combat is only one number thing is so weird. You'd have to figure something out about the, honestly, if you just took this and went, you're all literal bug-sized bugs. <laughs> 
in an actual for realsies on Earth house, <laughs> having an adventure, and we'll keep the psychic thing. Whatever. We'll you're psychically keep, linked. You, you want to keep the stuff about how they're... Uh, oh, well, sure. That's, that part's fine, because a hive mind. That's perfect. That makes perfect yeah. sense. You want to pick the stuff about how they have skills from when they were humans in a past life still? No, they, you're just a highly active bug. Okay, so you still... So your, uh, your three mystery stats just become three stats. Yeah, and because that, honestly, the mystery stats, it's not a mystery. It's just, this is a generic stat, and I like that. Instead of being like, for any time you want to do combat, you have to have your strength and your dexterity and your constitution. You're just like, no. Violence. It's violence. It's just that. That's it. Yeah. I like the idea of using this game to represent just bug-sized bugs living in a human house. That's fine. Yeah. Now they have to interact with shrunken children from Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and... And, yeah, uh, you'll and get in weird adventures. Ant Man shows up. All all the various like the Atom, other small superheroes, <laughs> the, bar, the borrowers. Let's see who else could show up in a house like that. I so. don't know. The Lilliputians show up. Oh, there you go. Yeah, it's good. Uh, the Littles. The uh, yeah. Who's, who's that mouse who drives a car? Uh, Stuart Little. There you go. Stuart Little can show yeah, up. Uh, Martin. The, oh, the, Sheen. The Fraggles shows up at yeah. some point. Yeah, and... a bunch of Fraggles, or if you're even smaller, Boobers. <laughs> what, 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 dozers. Do, doozers. Yeah, and, uh, the little ones. Stuart builds... Smalley. Yeah, he saves, he saves his family. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get to meet the stupids. Yeah. And the Droods. <laughs> and the Croods. Yeah. The, that CGI caveman movie from like yeah, two years ago. And the whatevers. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the Brian Setzer Bugastra. <laughs> okay. All right. <sighs> so. What would you say is your favorite thing about Numenon? Well, I mean, it's obviously the system. I mean, I hate that I'm gonna have to also take that from you. I don't, I'll figure something out. But the dominoes are the best thing in here. That system resolution mechanic is so quick for whatever, you're just like, alright, here's a domino, do you have anything that goes on that? No? Great, we're done. Yes? Great, you put it down. Yeah. I think, I would say that I feel like the dominoes might lead to a problem, uh, in that you're gonna have one player who's real good at dominoes. But and- it doesn't matter. You can't be good at having a number or not. I know. It, it just me. but, okay, let's say you don't really like figuring out domino, but, like, looking at them going, alright, do I have a five or a one or a four? Do I have a five or a one or a four? You're gonna end up just piling all your dominoes into a pile and letting the one guy who's good at dominoes play. And that's, that's fine. I mean, it's not terrible. It's just, to me, it could have, there could have been a little bit more of a, you have to play your dominoes mechanic. Well, you do. You know me. You know how much I, I fervently hate anti, or, or armchair quarterbacking. Well, no, because everyone holds their dominoes, and you can either play or not if you can play. Fair enough. So you can't just go, here's what I've got. Yeah. And anyway, because you're only pulling, like, five, it's not like you're trying to make a fucking giant train of No, and it's not impossible, and it's not like you have to do any kind of sequential connection to them. You can build a domino puddle instead of a domino line. Yeah. As long as you still have five of them that are connected long, on the yeah, table. As long as you can still connect to something, you're fine. Yeah, so it's it's alright. I, I think a domino system is fine too. I, I I had a little reticence about it when I first read it because I was like, man, you do that for a lot in this game. Like every time you want to do anything, you're like, alright, haul out the dominoes. But then again, it's not that slow and, you know... No, it's, and it's, this is a system that is less about the whole rolling to do something and yeah. more just talking about stuff. So by the end of the book, I'd come around and I also really enjoy the domino system. Alright, so your favorite thing then? I like the shared health pool. I like yeah. the I like the idea that the players are forced to deal with, or to defend each other. That they, uh, the shared everything in this game is impressive to me. Yeah, the teamwork focus is nice. Yeah, I it, like that. it's really well done. The characters are telepathically linked. They can heal the party by just wanting to. Like if you have a good rapport skill, you can stand around and spend an action just healing celebrity for the party. Uh, we never even talked about what the NPCs in this game are and what they look like. I want to do that real quick. Um, everything else in the game is called another, and it's just a it's usually a static nothing that's in there just to help you learn a lesson. And they don't even have salubrity, they just have strength, which is their hit points. And a lot of them are just sort of hollow shells that do the same thing all day, like video game NPCs. Yep. There you go. All right, great. What's your least favorite thing about this game? Uh, Everything that's between pages 1 and 75, right? Uh, So my least favorite thing is actually going to be after that, in that there is no discussion of what to do. Yeah. It presents you with an entire world... And I'm fine with world building. I'm fine if you want to say, these are all these weird rooms, there's all these puzzles. But if you don't have anything to then go on, there's no reason to have this book. Because otherwise you could just go, as like a GM, I could have made that up. I can go ahead and just take my dumb bullshit and randomly roll and say, you're in a room with lotus petals... Uh, there's a guy burning them slowly. And you have to, uh, make movies about, uh, feet. (laughs) God damn it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) On the background behind him is a movie about feet. (laughs) You figure it out. Like, 
that's the level that all of these different rooms are, is just, there's some stuff happening, you figure it out. If there was even a hint of, like, this is what we intended, then I would like it way more, but the fact that it's just not only a bunch of dumb esoteric crap, but there's no application for it. Well, the whole game is set up around these things called the Nine Enigmas. And they're like puzzles or keys or something. And here's the thing about them. They're the core MacGuffin of the game. You need them to to solve the Silhouette Rouge or escape or win or whatever. Yeah, that's how you win this RPG. Except they don't even tell you what they are. Like, no, not... it's just, there's nine enigmas. Well, what are they? Uh-huh. Yeah, you figure some. There's some, there's nine of them. That's what you know. Maybe there's ten. I don't know. Whatever. Some guy solved them once, probably. We're not sure. He may have or may not have. A lot of it feels like the first half of Dark Crystal, the movie, where like, where like Jen's got that crystal and he's like, what the hell is this for? What do I do? Where am I going? Do you know Agra? Nope. I sure don't. I just give you some crystals and you choose one. But you, you, you don't, don't even know what to do with it or where to go. Just keep wandering around, you gelfling. That's, yeah. <laughs> it feels like that. All right. So your least favorite thing in the book then? Uh, the first person stories, I'm going to say. I, I really, every time I get to a room and open it and I'm like, you know, it's, it's like when you come to, a part, you're reading Lord of the Rings and you hit some italics and you're like, oh, it's going to be an epic lay of or poetry about Baron and Luthien. Let's, uh, let's see how long this is. Seven, hey, ah, uh, ah, uh, come on. I don't want to read this huge epic poem. I want to read more about the hobbits. Let's, 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 let's roll along with this. That's every time I find one of those short stories in here, I'm like, oh, damn it. I don't care about you, Kai Tang, Jim Nin Yao. I don't care about your sword fight and it, you're not telling me what's in this room. That's for fucking sure. That's the biggest problem with them is normally you walk into a room and it's like, Here's what's in the room, here's what's happening in the room. You get to the first person story and it's like, here's what a guy did in this room. Maybe. You know? Sometimes it's not even in the room. No. Sometimes it's just a short story about a guy on a mountain or something. It's like, this guy, like, had to fight spiders with some girl. And you're like, okay, well if I go in there, is that girl going to be there? Is it gonna be... A- spiders? Like... Uh, what? Yeah, you just get a short story. I don't know if you're supposed to read it to the players when you come in. Like, oh, good, we hit a short story room. Everyone settle in, because I'm about to read a short All story. Right, everyone get your crackers and juice and lie down on your mats. It's story time. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was going to go beat poetry, and you went kindergarten, and I like it even more. <laughs> yeah, so th- I, I don't care for that. Uh, would you play Numenon? Oh, God. Okay, you As know is, as is. A- no, I know. <laughs> I would play this, given the caveat that the person who made this game runs it for me, because at least they know what they want to do with it. I doubt it. I would, I would at least say they're possibly knowing what they want to do, because they're the ones who wrote the rooms. So they have some idea in mind, maybe. Anyone else who was like, I'm gonna run Numenon, I go, you're gonna make up some dumb bullshit, and you're gonna try and use someone else's dumb bullshit to run this story. That's terrible. I wouldn't want to do that. So, 99% of the time, no. Maybe if it was the guy who made it, because he might have an idea. Okay. All also, right. I would run it with him, because then I could grab him and be like, why? <laughs> it, it, sold, it must have sold a little bit. Yeah, plus, this, like I said, the system is good, so I would play in the system. This would you fine. play Numenon? Numenon. Well, let's see. I would play in it if Quentin Tarantino was running it. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, that's 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 a given. I think I'd play any game if Quentin Tarantino was running it. <laughs> Except for the Sex Dice game. <laughs> Except for Sex Dice. I don't want to make any more movies about feet, Quentin. I just can't. <laughs> it's not me. It's the dice. The dice. It's just It just keeps coming up like that. Yeah, you can see the other sides, and they all say make movies about and feet. Sometimes I roll feet feet. I don't even know what I'm supposed to do in that situation. I do. I quit. <laughs> oh, oh, I know. I know. <laughs> Make movies about make movies about. Oh damn it! Yeah, that's that's how I uh, that's how I made Inglorious Bastards. Yep. There's a lot of stuff in there about making movies. About making movies. Yeah. About 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 feet feet. There's still feet though. <laughs> you know, you get on a foot rut and you just you just keep putting feet in there. Yeah, you get mad ruddy on foot. That's a uh, excuse me. I I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, I have no idea what Quentin Tarantino actually sounds like. And I should, because he's in several movies. Yeah, you'd think that, but no. Oh, well. Okay, so there you go. We both played... I, I, yeah, I'd probably play this, it, provided that it was run functionally. Yeah. it's The rules are so good. They really are. If, if you, it, This is a rare game from us where we're going to tell you to go check it out. It's on drive through PDF and whatever. It's infuriating to read, but very interesting yeah. in how unique it is. Yeah, we're both... I, I'm... I'm I, I, I'm infuriated at, at, at the grad studentiness and the Psych 101 as if it was something that no one had ever heard of before that's all over this thing. On the other hand, I really like the rules, so it's going to get a recommend from me. Yep. Yeah, so there you go. That's Numenon. 
Check it out. It's pretty neat. Yep. And speaking of checking things out, please go to iTunes and Stitchers where you can rate and review us. Rating and review helps the show. It helps us bring you quality content like <laughs> Numenon. <laughs> rate and review and you'll receive a tote bag. Ra- rate and review and you too will get your own customized <laughs> sex dice from Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> you know, if we ever actually do make custom dice, that's going to be the first thing we make. Yeah, right? 100%. If you go to our Patreon and you get us over a certain level, we will make you custom sex dice from Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> make movies happy. Oh, that'd be amazing. <laughs> All right, so, uh, yeah, by all means, go and support us on iTunes and Stitcher. A lot of you already have, and that's great, so thanks so much for that. Yeah. We got all these great new reviews in there. For a long time, we had four, and one of them was just accusing us of cursing too much, which was the best. Well, I mean, it's true. It's true, we do. We don't need to. We could make the show not explicit. But why? I don't want to. Shit fuck Dan. (laughs) Shit fuck Dan. Yeah. (laughs) This is primarily aimed at Dan. The whole show. Shit fuck so yeah, other than that, we also have our Patreon, which you can go and support. We're we're doing pretty well, but if we get to a hundred, we can actually go to two microphones, and that would be amazing. Uh, we especially need the support right now because one of us, that'd be me, just lost his job. Oh, it's the saddest time right Aww. now. You s- know, in post production, we'll add the sad music from. Wah, wah, well, no, some sadder music. The, yeah. the, the, the uh, incredible walking Hulk. away. Yeah. <laughs> do 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 do. <laughs> so yeah, right now I'm actually relying on that Patreon to live. <laughs> Not really. It's only no, like not really. it's like thirty dollars a month. Yeah. So so <laughs> yay. Anyway, other than that, we still have t-shirts for sale on T Public. You can find them there by searching System Mastery. We're working on more, and uh, right now we have a vendor in the Labarong shirt that's that's in production. So that'll be available in a, in a couple of weeks. Look forward to that. And uh, if you have shirts you think we should be making and selling, tell us. Gay Tree Demon, whatever. Tell us what you want. Yep. Other than that, you can find us on iTunes and Stitcher and uh, Facebook and Twitter and Gmail, all at System Mastery. Except uh, I believe the web the blah, the website itself is systemmasterypodcast.com and support us there. Yeah, go there. Leave a comment. Tell us why we're dumb. Also, we got a bunch of good comments just recently uh, supporting that dumb movie episode we just did. The uh, the what did we just watch? Left Behind. Yeah. Starring- if, if you'd like us to do more dumb things that aren't RPG related, let us know. Well, actually, we got a lot of comments saying we should. They like the movie reviews. We've actually done. I think that was our fifth. Yeah, I, I'd forgotten a few of them that we've definitely done over the years. Yep. Uh, last time we talked about it, so things like Franken Queen, the worst movie that's ever been made by anyone for any reason. Yep. It even fails as gay porn, which is what it is. Yep. It fails on every level. So I think we will start doing a few more movie reviews. What we'll do is we'll separate them into a different feed so that we're not bombarding people who only want our RPG trenchant commentary. Yep. So look for system ma- or movie mastery coming soon. And if you have movies you think we should watch, please send us recommendations. We already got one. Uh, request to watch Zardoz and talk about it. That'll be interesting. I've never seen it, and I know it's terrible. I've seen it, and it's really weird. It's got that 70s sci-fi vibe, which is almost always bad. Yep, because yeah. it's always boring and slow. Yep, that's the thing. It's uh, Thankfully, it's set in uh, in po- the post-apocalypse, so there's not a lot of wood panel rooms with a sheriff in them. <laughs> the hallmark of the 70s. All right, we're way over budget, so thank you so much for listening. Continue listening in the future, and until then, next time, have a great week.